throw something at us, you know, uh, uh, since on wild goose chase. He told us that, that in this world you're going to have tribulation, but then he said, be of good courage, for I have overcome the world. And uh, 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 the implication is, if you're following him, you're following the one that's going to overcome whatever you're going through. Amen. Amen. Uh, uh, so, yeah, keep in mind, he is the God of the valley, too. We're learning how to praise him during those times as well. And, uh, uh, oh, uh, yeah, we do have uh, a baptism this afternoon and, uh, uh, at 4.30, looking forward to baptizing Jamie and, and Rose and Faith and uh, uh, whoever else wants to be dunked, uh, I think we have an extra robe for you. Uh, I think for two more. I think we got five robes. I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's right, Tony. And uh, Tanya, you getting, you getting baptized? All right. All right, okay. Amen. Well, I think we got just enough. Uh, all right. That's right. Amen. Amen. So I'm looking forward to that. And uh, uh, I, I, I apologize for having it in the evening, if that might be inconveniencing uh, uh, for you. Uh, uh, but knowing the system, how it works, you know, uh, next time we have a baptism service, we can have that during the morning service. Uh, uh, but now we kind of, you know, this, this, is, this is new to us uh, to actually have a baptismal pool, like I said, in our own church. And, uh, uh, that's a, a real a wonderful privilege to have because of the, the pastor that we mentioned before. Uh, he's got a baptismal pool already, but he, he appreciated the offer. But uh, when he, he had one and we didn't, you know, he invited us to, to have a service with him. And we had several people to be baptized. And it was like a big spiritual family reunion. <laughs> you know what I mean? Different churches involved, different pastors. It was three different pastors, including myself. And uh, each one of us had members to be baptized, and we shared that baptismal pool. And uh, uh, so thank you for, for, for being kind enough, my own church family, for being open to, to having someone share our pool with us. Uh, we appreciate that. It's kingdom-minded. And, and uh, I, I commend you, and I also brag on you because this is my church. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's my church. This is the way my church thinks. You know, I like that. Uh, very healthy. And uh, uh, it was something that I wanted to say to you. Oh. An announcement, we're going to have, uh, uh, on second Sundays, we'll have a uh, uh, praise team start back up and dance the arts. Uh, we're going to uh, jump start that again and see what happens, see what the Lord does with it. Sister Heidi will be, uh, will be doing that. And that's her right there if you don't know who it is. If that's not her, she's sitting in her seat. So somebody better warn whoever this young lady is before Heidi shows up. All right, everybody paid their tickets and they got their seat, their signed seat. So they <laughs> praise God for that. And uh, 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 we have um, refreshments after that as well. Um, keep that short and simple. And uh, uh, pray for us also because we also have to, we not have to, we get to go to the fair this evening. <laughs> you know, and, uh, uh, we might try out that, 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 uh, Hamburger, donut hamburger? That doesn't sound appealing to me, really, to tell you the truth. I don't know if a donut hamburger, it some of the create some strange stuff at the fair. Try that, try that watermelon pie for us. Watermelon pie? I'm going to try that. I heard about that. Yeah. Huh. Said it was good. Oh, man, I, I might do that. I might do that. It's fruit, and it's supposed to be in a pot. It's not, you know what I mean? It's not, it's not a donut with some meat in it. <laughs> and some cheese, some mustard. You know, we're going to do that. Right? Anyway. <laughs> I just want to throw that out at you. Be you know, in prayer. Be uh, in prayer for our, our baptismal service. I'm going to give you a little a short word before we do get into, get into the water. And uh, 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 show the significance, and, and uh, uh, our message today has to relate to that as well, because it's part of your discipleship when you come into the body of Christ, or when you come in through baptism, uh, or when you choose to be identified with Christ through baptism. Now you're identifying with the body of Christ in discipleship. It's time to be trained and educated in the Word of God, so that we can learn how to live for it. Amen. Uh, so uh, with that being said, we'll just carry on with the service and, and uh, uh, see what Charles Spurgeon has to say to us. Because we can put it on our Facebook. <laughs> Nobody ever outgrows scripture. The book widens and deepens 
with our years. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I can yeah. I can attest to that myself. Mm -hmm. And put it into words for me. Huh? Thank you, Marcel. We appreciate that. So it's going to widen and deepen for us in this session today. Uh, uh, Lord willing, I pray, I pray that you can receive what God has for you. Uh, and since you have your Bibles with you, we can get right to it because I got three PowerPoints to leave you with. Uh, if you would, open up with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, let's stand to our feet. For the reading of the word. You get that. 1 Peter chapter 1. Short verse of scripture. Let's see what Peter's saying to us. He says, You have been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the message today you prepared my heart to share with this flock, your people. And Lord, I pray that you would give me your anointing, grant your anointing to not just teach and preach, but to hear and understand that we might apply the truths that you revealed to us today, Father. Thank you for transforming us with the truth of your word. And we thank you for opening our eyes and enlightening the eyes of our understanding that we might see and know who we are in you, that we might take our place as sons and daughters under the new covenant. And we thank you for our rights and privileges as sons and daughters, that we might exercise them and enjoy the victory of it before you come to receive us to yourself. And we give you praise for your word and the work that it does in us in advance because you're worthy of it. And we love you for it in Jesus' name. Those in agreement said amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Uh, and for your notes, sermon title, The Nature of the New Creation. That's what we're going to be looking at. The Nature of the New Creation. And uh, this... This study, if you want to call it that, sermon, teaching, uh, basically it's education from the Word of God. And uh, uh, not only that, it's training for your spirit man, the hidden man of the heart. Your spirit man needs to be trained and exercised as well as educated so that it becomes a reliable source that God can use to lead us throughout life and throughout the daily affairs of our lives. Did you realize that your, your spirit can be trained and educated? Uh, it's more than just being fed the Word of God. When you get fed, you know, uh, uh, you're nourishing your inner man, but you're also, through the Word of God, you're being educated in the Word. Uh, uh, that is our university. It, it, and, and, and here's another way of looking at it. Whenever you look at the Word of God, your Bible, that is the constitution of your government. The government of the kingdom of God. That's the government that we're ran by. That's the government that we adhere to. And when we learn how that government works in the earth, we benefit from it as children of God, as the family members of God. Uh, uh, I know that I, I, I tend to use movies a lot, but movies are the perfect <coughs> parable to illustrate truth from God's word. Uh, and especially science fiction, you know, you, I, I always say this, that truth is stranger than fiction. And uh, uh, a lot of times we buy into fiction to the point where we exclude truth or we, we filter truth out. You know, what do I mean by that? I mean, sometimes if we, if we feed ourselves an unhealthy diet of fiction, it can cause us to miss out or obscure the truth, miss out on the truth, which sets us free, or obscure the truth, obscures it to where we can't benefit from it. And remember, uh, Hosea 4, 6 says that my people perish for a lack of knowledge. And, and take that, put it on hold for a minute, and, and look at the lives uh, uh, that people live, some people live, or your own life in particular. You know, and if you're winning or, 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 or you're, you're failing, well, I'll put it like this, if you're failing, uh, you can connect it to a lack of knowledge of God's ways, how he does things. And when you're talking about the Bible being his government, we understand how God operates because we have it's an open book test to life's problems, to life's issues. You see that? Uh, so we learn how to operate like God, 
we educate ourselves on how God does things, now we start acting like children of God in a, in a fallen world. That's when you become a light in a dark place, you see. Uh, that's also how you become salt in a, in a bland world, if you, if you would. You know, uh, like you said before, you can't make a, a, a horse drink water. You can't you can leave him to water, but you can't make him drink. You know, uh, but you can't make them thirsty if you give them some salt. Mm -hmm. You see, uh, so we want the world to become thirsty with our lives or by our lives uh, as we learn how God does things, uh, and we do it that way. When we operate the way He operates, we become salty to the world. It, it makes the world curious about why we're standing, how we're able to do what we do, and why we still have hope when things look bleak. You see. Uh, God wants us to become little Jesuses. That's the way we put it before. And when you're talking about the new creation, as it relates to fiction, like I said before, now I, I've been I've been caught up with this thing. Now it's just been fascinating to me. Uh, 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 and and you know how how YouTube does it if you if you if you do this like I do. You know uh, if you have YouTube, you know the things that you tend to watch most most it'll send you suggestions like this might be something that you would like, you know, and it would send you different things like that. Well, I got several categories that I do like, and one of them happens to be the superheroes. All right? Don't judge me. <laughs> yeah, uh, I like the superheroes, and, and what I found to be fascinating is, is you know, you got a wide range of different, different characters, you know, uh, uh, from different genres, like you got anime, you know, Japanese, uh, uh, heroes and things like that with different superpowers and abilities and things like that. Then you got Marvel and you got uh, uh, their villains and, and characters and you got DC and you got their villains and characters. So they all have their own their own thing. You know what I mean? Their own thing that makes them unique. And uh, uh, what they've been doing though, on, on, on what I've been watching, is they'll take somebody from DC and match them against somebody with Marvel. And, and they'll go by the strengths and abilities of each character to see who would win in a fight. You know, uh, I'm not a betting man, but, you know, I, I like to see who's going to come out on top. You know, the Hulk versus, you know, a, a juggernaut, you know, an unmovable force and an unstoppable object. You know what I mean? How are they going to meet when they, when they come together? But what, what interests me is how it goes through the profile of their strengths and characters, what they're like. You know what I mean? And when you realize what they're really like, and you put that over against another character that's a, a certain way, and you find that their strengths and characters, you find a, 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 a clash that makes for, for good entertainment. <laughs> you know? Uh, in the same way, I'm likening that to a superhero in the Bible called the new man or the new creation. This is something that God has made in the finished work of the cross. And this is who you are if you're born again. All right? I want to look at it again with that thought in mind. And I said before, what was that? First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1 says, You have been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Now, that's our springboard scripture that we're going to springboard from. Now, we've already analyzed the new man in exchange for the old man. Do you remember that? Uh, we now know that there is an old man to be crucified, and when he's crucified, the new man emerges. Uh, the new man is the hidden man of the heart, this new man. And now that we know that there is such a thing, this new man, what I want to look at briefly today is the nature of this new man, or let's call this new man a new creation, all right? Second Peter, I'm sorry, Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Everybody say creation. 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 The new you, I can't see. I don't see you. I don't see the new you. You don't see the new me. But you see the outworkings of the new you and new me. All right? As we train our human spirit, which is the new us, that's when our behavior starts conforming to the government the kingdom of God, the, our government, uh, uh, the Father's kingdom. We start looking more and more like Jesus as we, we gain knowledge of his word, and we're training our new us, the new creation, that new, new person on the inside. So we're going to look at the nature of this new creation just like we would a superhero uh, on YouTube. Look at the profile and see what you're capable of. See what God has made you to be 
And when we learn that, we, we ought to learn to live from that. You see that? We're going to learn to live from what we learn of that new nature. Now, I want you to note something since we looked at that verse of Scripture. Uh, note that the nature of the seed determines the nature of the life that comes out of it. All right? The nature of a seed determines the nature of the life that comes out of that seed. In other words, you plant a rose, uh, a rose seed, then the nature of that life that it's going to produce will be the same as the seed. The rose will, will be connected to that seed because the, the nature is the same. The DNA is the same. That's the way you can look at it. In other words, if you sow an orange seed, you don't get an apple, right? right. Uh, and if you sow an apple seed, you don't get an orange. You don't get that. So how does that translate over into who we are as new creatures in Christ? Well, if you are born as a, as a natural person of corruptible seed, then you'll have a corruptible life. You see that? A once born person is born of corruptible seed. Therefore, a corruptible life is the outcome of that. So if that's the case, then what kind of life uh, is that life, that corruptible life? Uh, well, that's a life that's subject to the process of corruption. A corruptible life is a life that's subject to a, the process of corruption. You remember the uh, illustration I used last week about the peach? You know, a peach is a beautiful thing, you know, and you get it, uh, you, know, uh, <laughs> you know, you get a brand new peach, it's kind of, kind of, you know, it's, 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 it's tough. You know what I mean? And tart and things like that. But when you let it sit for a while and mature and it becomes soft and sweet, you know, and that's a, that's, a, that's a positive, right? Let it sit too long, it'll become mushy and no good. And it also loses its freshness, the taste. What's happening to the peach? It's in the process of corruption. You see that? That's the nature of this world that we live in. It's a fallen world subject to corruption. All right? So anybody born into this world, just like this world is subject to corruption, that person, that once born person, is subject to corruption as well. All right? Are you getting the picture? But what if you're born again? What if you're reborn? All right? Now, that's not a once born person. If you're born again of incorruptible seed, however, what will happen is you'll enjoy incorruptible life. Amen. All right, you get it. Praise God. You get a chance to enjoy incorruptible life if you are born again of incorruptible seed. So write this down. Here's your first PowerPoint. It's going to make more sense as we go along. Go further. The key word describing the new nature is incorruptible. Okay? This new creature, this new creation that God has made in us since we're in Christ now, is incorruptible. It's incorruptible. If the seed is incorruptible, we've already deducted that the life that it produces would have to be incorruptible too, right? So you're born again, not of incorruptible seed, I'm sorry, of, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed. That's the word of God. So that makes you, the new creature, incorruptible. Hmm. It's going to make sense in a minute, I promise and feel free to ask questions afterwards, all right? Comments and questions afterwards. So here's a twofold question for you that, that I, I want you to ponder for a minute. What is the seed that brings forth the new man? And what causes it to be incorruptible? Good question, right? The answer is, it's the seed of God's word, and it produces incorruptible life. The seed of God's word, it produces incorruptible life. Uh, I think another translation calls it sperm even. even uh, that would indicate that God's seed or sperm has incorruptible DNA. DNA in it. So when he produces something, whatever he produces, since it's incorruptible, it's going to be incorruptible since he is. His life or whatever extends from him will be incorruptible just like him. Amen? So the seed of God's word, it produces incorruptible life. Now I want you to look at James chapter 1. Flip over to James chapter 1 verse 18. And when you get there say I got it. Alright. You got it? 
got it. Got it. James chapter 1, verse 18. It says, of his own will, he brought us forth, or he begot us again. That's another way of looking at that. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. Do you see that? He brought us forth by the word of truth. One says that we've been born of incorruptible seed, which is the word of God. And now he says that we have been brought forth by the word of truth. Now notice this. That the new man is the product of the truth. The new man is the product of the truth. So that brings us to our second PowerPoint. PowerPoint number two is the truth of God's word begets in us an incorruptible nature. You see that? The truth of God's word produces in us or begets in us an incorruptible nature. This is going to be good. I think you're going to enjoy it. See, that's one thing about the truth, like they say. The truth is its own defense. Have you ever heard that before? See, you don't have to do anything for the truth. I mean, the truth stands alone. You don't, you know, there's no big deal about the truth. It's going to stand no matter what. Uh, and if you've been begotten of the word of truth, you're going to stand too no matter what. You see? You're incorruptible. <coughs> You're going to stand no matter what. Because the truth stands by itself. The truth of God's word begets in us an incorruptible nature. Now what does that mean regarding to our tendency to sin? All right, now we're getting down to the brass tacks right here. Uh, what does it mean regarding to our tendency to sin? Because we have a tendency to go left sometimes. Would you agree? Sometimes we, we, we do get off, we, we get off the cross, and we let our flesh rule, we do what we want to do sometimes. Uh, uh, I want you to look at 1 John 3, 9, and I want to confuse you for a minute on purpose. 1 John chapter 3. And it's a little closer to, Re to Revelation, in between James and Revelation. 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. Let me know what you got there by clearing your throat. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Now remember, the question that hangs in the air is, what does this mean regarding to our tendency to sin? Now here's how it reads. It says, whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin. Ooh, it's a hard one, isn't it? We just all confess that we can go left sometimes, right? Hmm. So what is that saying to me then? What in the world is he talking about? Now, I know, now Ron Brewer, me, I can speak for me. Now Ron Brewer has been born again for over 20 years now, at least. All right? I say at least. I'm a young man still. You know, but 20 years now, I've been born again. But does that mean that now Ron Brewer has not sinned? In the 20 years that he's been born again, in the 20 years of his salvation, of course not. That does not mean that. I have seen. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, 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 if you'll be honest, you have too. <laughs> now, when we sin, see, this is what I've said before. Now, there is a clause in our membership that, that benefits us. If you are in the, in the family of God, you are a member of the family uh, then you have some benefits as a son or a daughter in the family of God with him being your father. One of them is, whenever you do sin, if we'll confess it, he's faithful and just to forgive us of the sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I want to bring attention to the fact that in the end of that, he says that he's going to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In other words, he's going to cleanse us from all that ain't right, all that's wrong, all that's wrong in our lives. Why will he do that? I'm glad you asked. He'll do that because he desires our fellowship. You see that? It's more than us just having a relationship with the Father. See, every born-again believer has a relationship with him, but not every believer fellowships with him. See, that's what we're coming into now. We're coming into a fellowship where we fellowship with the Father and his people, his children, and we enjoy that fellowship. That's where we find our joy. And whenever we sin, one of the first things that leaves us is our joy. You see that? So how does God restore our joy? 
He restores it by having us confess our sin, admit that we messed up, so that he can be faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. See, he wants to cleanse us so that we can get back into fellowship. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. See, when we sin, here's what sin is, another way of looking at it. Sin is self-banishment from God's presence. You see? You can have your Bible sitting right next to you. You can be reading your Bible. If you get ready to sin, for some reason you'll push your Bible over to the side. You'll cut your Christian music off. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm about to say something, Lord, I don't want you to hear, you know, or whatever. You know, uh, you tend to banish yourself from his presence whenever you sin. That's why God wants to cleanse you so that you can come back into his presence. Remember what righteousness is? It's the ability to stand in the presence of God without any sense of guilt or condemnation. See, sin causes you to experience guilt and condemnation, and that will keep you from his presence. That will keep you from fellowshipping with him. And as a byproduct, it will keep you from fellowshipping with his people. You see? And you don't have any joy in that. You've lost your joy because of sin. Your joy gets restored when you come back into fellowship with the Father. And P.S., you will start fellowshipping with his people again. You see? Whenever you look at that, that, that parable of the lost, you see the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son. We're going to the lost sheep. You know, it says that the shepherd, the good shepherd, he, you know, he's a wise shepherd. He'll leave the 99 to go find the one sheep that's lost. Why? Because he's not a fool. You know, this sheep is valuable to him. And he loves the sheep. He'll lay his life down for the sheep. Now, here's the question I would pose to you. Where is home for the sheep? Glad you asked that one too. So I like this. this is the fun part about preaching. See, I get to ask the questions and answer them. You see that? So where is home to the sheep? It's not in the sheepfold. Home to the sheep is wherever the shepherd is. You see that? Wherever the sheep is found, back in presence with the, with the shepherd, that's home to the sheep. P.S. He'll walk him right back to the sheepfold where the rest of the sheep are. So you don't ever find a wild sheep in the, wood, in the woods. Is anybody afraid of going to the woods because you might get mauled by a wild sheep? <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, uh, sheep, they need to be in a sheep fold. Otherwise, they're wolf food or bear food or lion big food, whatever, whatever food you could say. You know? uh, 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 they're prey, basically. And Satan lurks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour he loves to divide and conquer. If you can take, if you take an offense and you allow it to, to have root, it will separate you from fellowship with God and fellowship with his people. You see? Uh, if you allow sin in your life, it will cause you to, to uh, feel guilt and condemnation and you won't come into the presence of God. You'll break fellowship with him. You'll lose your joy and you'll, you won't fellowship with his people. He wants to restore that, though. So you're in a healthy place when you fellowship with each other, when you fellowship with God. Amen? Amen? We're where we're supposed to be. Now, we got to deal with this, though. 1 John 3, 9, it says, Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin. Well, we've already established the fact that before the, well, the time we were, we were saved from then to now, we've messed up several times, but we had that clause in our membership. How many of you have ever taken advantage of that clause in your membership? <laughs> Amen? You should you should take advantage of it because God wants you to be restored. Uh, I like the way T.D. Jakes puts it whenever he's you know, referring to that scripture. He says, admit it, quit it, and forget it. You see? Don't keep bringing it up after you've received the forgiveness. You see, you receive forgiveness from God, he forgets about it. He chooses not to bring it up against you anymore, so don't do it, do it to yourself. You see that? He knows that that will keep you out of his presence and you won't be able to fellowship with him. All right? So my conclusion then, if that's the case, uh, is that John, what he's talking about, is not the individual. He's not talking about Nairon. He's not talking about Nilena or, or, or Marty or, or, or Jamie. He's talking about the new man in the individual. You see that? The one that cannot sin because his seed is in him and he cannot sin, that's the new man on the inside. The new man that's on the inside of you is incorruptible and he cannot sin. Does that make sense? He's incapable of sin. 
That's why I love 1 John 5, 4. Look at that one, if you would. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. And we're about to, about to finish, too, believe it or not. <coughs> there you, does that mean you found it? <laughs> Clear your throat if you found it. Go ahead on. 1 John 5, 4 says, Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. The world. Now, did you notice something else about the new creation, the nature of this incorruptible person on the inside? It's not just a whoever, but it's also a whatever, the new man. The new man is not just a whoever, but he's also a whatever. The Apostle John, he's even talking about James or Bill or, like I said, Chris. He's actually talking about the new man produced in us by the word of God. The new man has been produced in us by the word of God. He is a product of truth. And like I said, truth will stand under every circumstance. You see? So again, the corruptible seed, it produces, or I should say the incorruptible seed, it produces an incorruptible nature. So does that mean that once we are born again, we can never sin? No, that's not what it means. What it does is it depends on which nature is allowed to control us. Which nature? So write this down. Here's your third and final PowerPoint. The old man cannot help sinning. The new man cannot sin. The old man cannot help sinning. The new man cannot sin. <coughs> so I think there's been confusion over this verse uh, in, in times past. Because we fail to contrast that over against the old man. See, some people have taken that verse and they say, well, since, since it says that I, 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 uh, I'm incorruptible, I can't sin anymore because his seed is in me. Anybody, if, you, if, you, if you're sinning, that means that you're not a child of God. But they were implying that they don't sin themselves if they are a child of God. I don't sin because it says right here, you can't sin. Uh, well, that's not necessarily so. Uh, uh, uh. If you compare that or contrast that over against the old man, it makes perfect sense. You see? Because I know that we all have sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. And even after we're born again, we're not sinners saved by grace. We're children of God. And we have the life of God. And we are partakers of his divine nature. But now what we've come to discover is we can choose to live from that new man within or we can allow our flesh to dominate our lives. You see that? Our flesh. That's where our old, na old nature is found. And he can't be redeemed. He can't be salvaged. He has to be crucified. Everybody say crucified. crucified. See, I have to consider that old man dead. But I have to do that all the time. See, that old man, he always wants to come off the cross. You see? That flesh. See, when I nail my flesh to the cross, so I consider myself dead to sin, and I have the image of the cross in my head, my flesh can't do anything. My hands and feet can't go sin any, anymore. So I reckon myself dead to him. Now when I do that, the life of Christ is resurrected in me. I can now live unto God with my flesh crucified. But as soon as I let my flesh off the cross, then I bind my new man, my spirit man. He can't dominate my life. He can't control my life. I'm now letting my old man dominate my life. And remember, the old man is corrupt, so he's going to produce a corrupt life. You see that? And he's going to subject me to corruption. See, that's why I says the wages of sin is death. There are degrees of death. You see, you don't just automatically die, but anytime you sin, you die a little bit. You see that? Anytime you worry, after Jesus said not to do it, <laughs> You know what I mean? See, he didn't suggest that you don't worry. He says, don't worry about tomorrow. Take no thought for tomorrow. Now, stop right there. If Jesus, our new Lord, tells us to do something or tells us not to do something, and we do it, that's contrary to him, right? That's a sin. That's a sin. The way Jesus says is death. If he told me not to worry and I do it anyway, but now i got a migraine headache or i got an ulcer in my stomach uh, because I'm worried. Did God do that to me? No. No, he didn't. See, here's another, another thing about sin. Sin causes you to self-destruct. You see that? 
Not only do you self-banish yourself from his presence, but you also self-destruct. God didn't have to do anything to you. You killed yourself in your sin. You see? You're subjecting yourself to corruption. And you start the process of corruption, see? You start doing that. Now, just the fact that we're, by the fact that we're in this fallen world, we're sub subject to corruption. But, like he says, though our outer man is perishing, our inner man is being renewed day by day. Now, that we're talking about just every Sunday. That was talking about every day. Now, Sunday, we, we, get a, we get a message like this, but you should be renewing your inner man day by day. That will help preserve your life. Bless you. That's pretty good. I call it to it. Bless you. Tidy, right? That's right. Amen. So whatever is born of God overcomes the world. So the new man is both a whatever and a whoever. All right? And the old man cannot help sin. The new man cannot sin. Now, what you do, it actually depends on who is in control. That's what we've already said. That's important to understand. So what do I mean by that? Well, a person who's never been born again can't help sin. They can't help sin. Uh, the reason why? is because his very nature causes him to sin if you're not born again, okay? Uh, now, you cannot be born again and live a good moral life and still be sin. See, the reason why, here's another, another definition of sin. Sin means to miss the mark, right? Mark missing. Referred to by the, uh, uh, the Benjamites. Uh, they were left-handed. They threw, you know, they had their slingshots and they were very accurate with their slingshots and their left hand and and uh, 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 they would always hit the mark, what they would do with their left hand. Uh, 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 if you miss the mark, that would be sin. Get that? Sin. So sin is missing God's mark. Okay? If you're not born again, you can't help but miss God's mark, even if you're doing good in life. The reason why is because you set up your own target. Does that make sense? See, when you set up your own target as a, as a, as a once-born person, you can hit your own target every time. It's not good enough for God. That's why we all fall short of the glory of God. We haven't hit his mark, uh, but now we have come into the new creation. We've come into the new birth. I put it like that, into the family of God. We're born of love. We keep the command now because we follow the new commandment. That is to love. That's what it's been, it's been about all along. You know, we love and we keep every one of the Ten Commandments because the center of it is love. Anytime we operate outside of love, we're sinning. You see, we're operating selfishly. See, God's love is selfless, and our, our, the only kind of love we have is selfish. You see, the corrupt man, the highest kind of love that he has is eros love. Everyone say eros. eros. See, that's a human kind of love, and it, it 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 only reaches out to the biggest, the best, the prettiest, the most beautiful the smartest, and once he gets hold of those, it draws a circle around him and says nobody else can come in. You see, that it's an exclusive kind of love. It's also a boomerang kind of love, too, because it throws itself out only to get it back in return. That's Eros love. I'll give it to you as long as you give it to me, but when you stop giving it to me, it gets unequitable. You know what I mean? I'm giving more than you are, then I'll stop. That's conditional. Eros. That's what man has. You see? And uh, uh, apart from being born again, that's the best that man can come up with. That's why it misses God's mark, you see. But once you've been born of love, born again of love, God is love, agape, that's a love for others, a self for others. It's selfless. It will love the unlovable, you see. It's unconditional. You can't do anything to earn that kind of love. And you've been born of that kind of love. Now you're capable of loving like God does, unconditionally. That new man is capable of loving just like God does. And any time it operates outside of that, it's sin. It's operating in a, corruptible, corrupted, uh, uh, a corruptible way. You see that? The difference between a, a person who's born once and a person who's born again, a person who's born again, they have an option. See, a person who's only born once, they can't help but sin because they have their own target set up. They're not even playing God's game. But now that you've been born again, you now can both do yours or you can do God's way. Not God's way. You see that? Uh, so if we allow, I'm going to conclude with this, if we allow the new nature to remain in control, we don't sin. 
But if we will allow the old nature to reassert itself, that's what we see. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for today's message. Uh, uh, Lord, we pray that you would help us to apply, apply this word to our lives. Help us to walk in what we've, we have revealed today. And Holy Spirit, I thank you for empowering us to live and to do what your word says and not just be a hearer only. Lord, help us to love with your love. Help us to live with your life and from the new man within. And we give you praise for that. And thank you for the privilege. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Any questions or comments?